Hey everyone, welcome back to Innovation Strategy. Today we're going to talk about how firms decide which R&D projects to pursue. It's very common for firms to have way more project ideas than they could effectively support. And all these ideas might be really different from each other in terms of their strategic importance, their time to pay off, their level of risk, and their fit with existing capabilities. How do managers decide which projects to pursue? It's useful to think of the firm's R&D projects collectively as a portfolio, and that portfolio has a mix of objectives that projects are intended to meet. Let's start with the dimensions of degree of change and years to pay off. Projects that impose a low degree of change and pay off quickly might seem like safe short-term bets that are good for cash flows. Projects that have a high degree of change and will take a long time to pay off look riskier, but might be important for the firm's long-term growth. For example, derivative projects create relatively small changes and usually pay off within a couple of years. These are things like incremental improvements to existing products and processes and seem like relatively safe investments. For example, between the 2016 model of the Prius and the 2019 model of the Prius, there were lots of incremental improvements like new headlight styling, new rims, and more black accents. These changes were relatively easy and help keep the models fresh so that the Prius keeps cash pouring in. Platform projects, such as a new family or generation of products, might create a higher degree of change and might take somewhere between two and five years to pay off. For example, the original development of the Prius was a major platform project. It created multiple models, each with different trim levels, so that the cars could meet different market needs. Breakthrough projects are those that create big changes and might take up to 10 years to pay off. These are things like revolutionary new products or processes. For example, we would probably consider Toyota's joint venture with Joby Aviation to create an electric vertical and takeoff landing vehicle, a breakthrough project. Last but not least, sometimes firms invest in advanced R&D projects that don't even have an explicit commercial objective. These projects tend to look pretty risky about whether and when they will ever pay off, but they might be important to the firm's long-term strategic objectives. This is the category we would probably put Toyota's Smart City in. The Toyota Smart City is a 2,000-person city of the future where it will test autonomous vehicles, smart technology, and robot-assisted living. Managers should choose how many projects to have in each category based on the firm's strategic positioning and resources. For example, a technologically leading firm with a reputation for high performance might have projects balanced all across this spectrum. On the other hand, a cash-strapped, low-cost provider might primarily have derivative projects. Finally, it's important to realize that many firms compete in multiple business areas, and they may need a separate R&D portfolio for each of those business areas. Okay, now that we know what we want our overall R&D portfolio to look like, how do we go about prioritizing individual projects? Methods for assessing projects include quantitative methods like discounted cash flow methods and real options, qualitative methods like screening questions and QSort, and methods that combine qualitative and quantitative info like conjoint analysis and data envelopment analysis. A very popular way of assessing projects is to calculate their discounted cash flows. You know that old expression, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush? That's referring to the fact that a promise of something tomorrow isn't worth what having something in hand is today. This means we need to discount promises of future cash flows. If, for example, we expect a project to pay out cash flows of $1,000 a year for the next four years, and we apply a 6% discount to those payments for each year, we'll find that the total present value is $3,465.11. People tend to like quantitative methods because they yield concrete numbers and they result in very persuasive presentations. It's really important to remember, though, that those concrete numbers actually came out of qualitative and subjective guesses about the future, like how many customers will want it, what will customers be willing to pay, will there be unexpected development costs, and how will competitors respond? That means that quantitative methods are sort of like a wolf in sheep's clothing. The concrete numbers create the illusion of certainty, and that keeps people from asking the hard questions they should be asking about how the estimates were arrived at. 
A popular qualitative method of assessing projects is to go through a series of screening questions. So for example, with respect to the market, we might ask who are the most likely customers of the new product? How big is the market? Are there other markets for the product? What type of marketing will be required to create customer awareness? With respect to use of the product, we might ask how will customers use the product? Will the product be compatible with the customer's existing complements? Will the product require significant learning on the part of the customer? And will the product require customers to bear other costs? With respect to distribution and pricing, we might ask where will the customer buy the product? Will the product require trial, installation, or assembly? And how much are customers likely to be willing to pay for the product? With respect to capabilities, we might ask, does the firm have the necessary capabilities or will they be developed in-house or acquired externally? Do competitors have better capabilities for developing this project? Will the firm be able to protect its intellectual property? And will the project help the firm build important new capabilities? With respect to timing, we might ask, how long will the project take to complete? Will the firm be first to market? Is being first to market necessary or desirable? Is the market ready for this product? That is, are suppliers, complements, and distribution channels available? And if the firm misses its target deadlines, what impact will this have on the value of the project? And finally, with respect to costs, we'll want to ask, how much will the project cost? What is the variability in these costs? What will production costs be? And at what rate are these costs expected to decrease with experience? And will the firm need to bear other costs related to things like complements, installation, and marketing? It should be clear that quantitative methods and qualitative methods have different strengths and weaknesses. Quantitative methods help us assess the timing implications of cost and cash flows. They're useful for what-if analysis, and they're very persuasive. Qualitative methods, on the other hand, can help us to assess the strategic considerations of a project, especially if it's long-term or risky. They also make the assumptions and uncertainty explicit. It's usually a good idea to use both quantitative methods and qualitative methods. Quantitative methods tend to be pretty effective for derivative projects where the payoff period is short and there's less uncertainty, but you're going to need qualitative methods to assess longer term platform projects and breakthrough projects. Therefore, it makes sense that we're going to have to use multiple kinds of methods to assess projects to achieve our desired portfolio balance.